safety takes a team effort. And your job on the organizing committee is to use care and caution while organizing the workplace and to follow the following advice. Do not watch this on a workplace computer or phone. I've organized this video into six separate steps. Step one, security, is basically about how not to get caught by your boss, because your boss doesn't really want you doing this. Step two is about how you can figure out which union in your area to contact so you can get advice from a union organizer to help with your specific situation. Step three has some ideas on how you can spark the initial union conversation with a trusted coworker so you can start forming what's called an organizing committee. Step four is about how to obtain or build a comprehensive list of employees at your work and how to map social relationships as well as the physical workplace itself, which helps with Step five, which is about strategically planning one-on-one -on -one conversations with coworkers who may be a good fit for joining the organizing committee. And step six stands for agitate, educate, inoculate, organize, unionize. This is a general framework that you can use in your one-on-one -on -one conversations and will help you figure out if moving toward achieving public union status or if gaining subversive wins is most appropriate according to your committee's needs. Look, listen. Step one, security. The reason this is so important is that although there are certain rights we have on the federal level on paper, the reality is more complicated than what the official law says. On paper, we have a lot of rights when it comes to unions. There's a big fancy federal thing called the NLRB, or National Labor Relations Board, and their website says the following. Employees covered by the National Labor Relations Act are afforded certain rights to join together to improve their wages and working conditions with or without a union. Employees have the right to attempt to form a union where none currently exists or to decertify a union that has lost the support of employees. What do you think would happen if you told your boss something like, I know my rights and we're going to form a union so you will have to pay us more? The law says... The law! The law! The law! While it's illegal for bosses to fire us for organizing, they do it anyway. Being fined for wrongful termination costs them less than having to pay workers a living wage. Hello. <laughs> if the boss finds out you're organizing, they might fire you, force lower level managers to fire you, and fire them if they don't, reward lower level managers, supervisors, and snitchy coworkers for spying on you and giving info to the boss, promote you into management to pacify you and make you ineligible for further organizing activity, hire outside consultants to make superficial, short-term workplace improvements to pacify and divert organizers, etc, etc, etc. So in order to keep your workplace organizing safe, don't use workplace devices to communicate about union efforts. Don't talk about organizing with anyone with hiring or firing power. Don't try to sell the idea of forming a union in big groups of coworkers. Careful what you say on social media, especially if coworkers are friends with or follow you. So please, think about the decisions you make today and the impact they'll have tomorrow. See you around and stay safe. Step two, contact a union organizer. We're here to help. We're here to help. We're here to help. Contacting a union organizer and getting expert advice in person is going to help a lot more than listening to a random guy on YouTube. The best way to get in contact with one is by contacting a local union. But there are a ton of unions out there, so it can be hard to know where to start. If you're a normal person, these union logos and the random letters on them are probably meaningless to you. So let's break this down real quick. The IWW stands for Industrial Workers of the World, also known as the One Big Union. UAW it stands for United Auto Workers. And SEIU stands for Service Employees International Union. But here's the thing, the names of these unions probably don't mean what you think they do. The word industrial in the IWW doesn't mean you have to work in a factory or something to join them. They believe in something called industrial unionism, which means they think every worker of every industry should be bound together in solidarity instead of competing for wages across workplaces. They accept baristas, grocery store workers, nurses, construction workers, teachers, welders, musicians, literally any worker of any trade. You can even go to their website right now and become a dues-paying member, even if you're currently retired or unemployed. As of the time of this video being released, the UAW 
BMW has been in the news a lot for their massive national General Motors strikes, so you may have heard of them. But the word auto worker in UAW is kind of deceiving because they don't just organize auto workers, they also organize grad students at universities, nonprofit workers, and others. The phrase service employees might make you think that the SEIU only organizes like waiters in restaurants because of the word service, but they organize mostly healthcare workers within places like hospitals and nursing homes, as well as county and state government employees. They also organize janitors, security guards, and others. The reason I'm telling you all this is because while there are literally hundreds of unions in the US, and while there may be a lot wherever you live, you should just email or call literally any of them and try to get coffee with one of their organizers. You can ask them to explain what their specific approach is, and if they have the bandwidth for it, they may help you develop an organizing plan that far surpasses the advice I'm giving you in this video. So here, just type in unions near me and your city's name into your favorite search engine and see what comes up. I'll assume you know how to find phone numbers and email contacts from there. Last thing on this, union organizers are busy and may not get back to you right away, but while you wait for them to get back to you, go ahead and move on to Step 3. Talk with a trusted coworker. Identify just one coworker you trust. Somebody you're already friends with, maybe somebody you comfortably vent to about how petty or tyrannical management is. A face-to-face -face conversation will always be the best way to go, so if you have an opportunity in an environment where management and potentially snitchy coworkers won't hear you, just start talking about union stuff all you want. But, but it's 2019 and a lot of us have strong text message based relationships with our coworkers. In some cases, we communicate more through text than in person, as absurd and sad as that is. So I personally don't think texting about organizing is terrible security, but if you do think the person receiving the text might screenshot and share what you're saying as a way to undermine you, just don't take the risk. This is why the number one criteria for the first coworker you talk to is simply that you trust them. Here's one idea on how you can ease into the union conversation via text in a relatively safe way. Send a screenshot of a recent news headline about a big labor strike and make a joke about it. Something like, LOL, maybe if we went on strike, they would hire a decent DJ for the holiday party. Maybe get a bartender who knows how to make drinks. Ha ha ha. Laugh cry emoji. Laugh cry emoji. Laugh cry emoji. Laugh cry emoji. Laugh cry. The reason I think this is probably okay, despite face to face being best, is because if this results in a coworker expressing strong support for unions in general, you've already learned that they're a great candidate to talk to more in person later, more seriously. If they don't seem on board based on the text you sent, you can always just say that you were joking and either revisit the idea later or just never bring it up again. Any which way, no organizer from any union anywhere will be able to help you unless you initiate this conversation with at least one other person. In steps four through six, we'll take a deeper dive into figuring out who to talk to and what to say so you can slowly build up that thing I keep mentioning called the organizing committee. We must combine our powers. Let's do it. Let our powers combine. Step four, lists and maps. You need to make or obtain a list of every employee at your work. The easiest way is to find an employee roster or schedule and make a copy or take a picture. Building a list from scratch is fine too, and you'll eventually want a modifiable spreadsheet anyway. For an extra layer of security, you can name the list something like groceries or baseball or orange. You can also password protect spreadsheets. In general, make sure you have strong passwords. Try out howsecureismypassword.net to see how quickly someone could hack your password. A note on workers without workplaces. For workers without workplaces, such as Uber drivers and coffee shop MacBook people, listing and mapping stuff is going to be more challenging for you. If you are a workplaceless worker, I recommend two things. One, contact an organizer like I said in step two. And two, look for online communities in places such as reddit.com where you can connect with other workers who work for the same employer and start strategizing with them. Okay, back to the video. What is the purpose of the list? The main purpose right now is to help you and your trusted coworker build the organizing committee or core group, which is going to do most of the work needed to form the union. So far it's just you, but one person is not an organizing committee. But you did get that trusted coworker on board, right? So now there's two of you. Two heads building a comprehensive list are going to be able to figure out who the best candidate will be to be contacted next and recruited into the committee. Three heads is better than two. Eventually you'll get four people, then five, then six. You get the idea. 
You want the organizing committee to be as representative of the workplace as possible, which means you need to think about diversity in two ways. There's demographic diversity, like race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, things like that. But there's diversity around things like job title, department, day versus night shift, different regions. As a result of this need for diversity on the committee, you and your coworker are going to want to create a few different columns on your spreadsheet that map all this out. You want names, job title, shift, location, languages spoken, race, ethnicity, gender or gender identity, seniority or years worked at the job, etc. A column for important notes can help too. In this example, I've noted that somebody has a Bernie Sanders bumper sticker on their car. This likely means they're pro-union, so we know we should reach out to them eventually. This one says, sleeps with Jerome, and I put it here on purpose to say that you shouldn't write gossipy stuff like this. You can write close with Jerome, that's fine, because this list is also functioning as a sort of social map. This one was also thrown in as a kind of diversion. In the past, I would have assumed a Trump supporter was automatically anti-union, but then one that I spoke to expressed interest in joining the union. Be careful with your assumptions and keep your notes respectful. The note active grievances is important because typically where you find workplace grievances, you find a potential one-on-one -on -one conversation that leads to solutions and hope for a particularly demoralized coworker. There are a few criteria you're looking for in a good committee member, by the way. You want to recruit workers who are liked and respected and who are good at their jobs. The more they're liked by other workers, the more workers they'll bring along in the effort over time. If they're a hard, reliable worker, this makes it harder for management to find reasons to fire them if you guys are ever found out. Slackers are easier to fire for obvious reasons, plus they're just less reliable in general. This is Tyler. Tyler, with Grammarly's help, is unionizing his workplace right under the nose of Fox, Anita. Tyler sits just 15 feet away. All right, there, I fixed that stupid Grammarly ad. You know, those Google algorithms kept thinking I was going to be a good target for that ad, but little do they know I'd use it for communism. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, no, let's skip the Grammarly workplace map because the Dunder Mifflin one is way better. There's always a distance between a boss and the employees. It is just nature's rule. Are you going to eat with us? Of course. Hanging with my crew. Crew that I am one of. Okay, there we go. In that clip, Michael, the boss, just sat here in the break room with all the workers eating lunch. When you map your workplace, you want to note that. Does the boss go to the break room to eat? Do they leave at 12 every day? Do they take the stairs or elevator? Do they leave with the assistant manager or one of those ass kissy coworkers who's hoping for a promotion next year? Note the location of any security cameras, where the managers sit, and so on. From this map, it appears there are no security cameras on this floor of the building of Dunder Mifflin. We can note that here's where Michael's office is. The assistant manager, Dwight, sits here. Angela, who is very close to Dwight, sits here. Since you and the committee need to start planning one-on-ones soon, this map will help you figure out where the safest locations are to do this in person if you decide to do so within the office itself. Account for things like entrances, exits, windows, shipping and receiving areas, lunchrooms, restrooms, stairs, and elevators. If you and the committee ever decide to put leaflets out, do a banner drop from a window, engage in a slowdown, sit-in, or some other form of education or direct action, the map will help. Okay, on to the next step. So let's say you've got your coworker, you made your list, and you've made your map. Now it's time to use these tools to plan a one-on-one. -on -one. You need to figure out who you're going to talk to, where you're going to talk to them, and when you're going to talk to them. Hey, Angela. Hi. How's it going? It's okay. Listen, are you bringing anyone to Jim's party tonight? So it looks like Pam and whoever she was strategizing with decided on Angela in the break room sometime during the midday. Now, as we noted before, Angela's closeness to Dwight and Dwight's management position makes Angela a potentially risky person to bring into the conversation. Plus, while she has a good work ethic, her rigidity and judgmental attitude makes it so she's not all that well liked by her coworkers. We also know that Michael comes into the break room pretty often, so this location is iffy. Overall, this one-on-one -on -one was not super well planned. Uh, hey, uh, can I talk to you about something? About when you want to give me more of your money? No, Did you want to do that now? We can go inside. I'm feeling kind of good tonight. I was just, um... 
In this case, Jim and his strategy-minded comrades have chosen Pam to try recruiting into the committee. Pam's a much better candidate than Angela due to her lack of closeness to Dwight or Michael, and the fact that basically everybody likes her and because she's a reliable worker. The location is pretty good as well because it's outside, far away from the office, with no managers or security cameras around. So overall, it looks like this was a pretty well-planned one-on-one. Let's see how Jim does here. I'm in love with you. Jesus f dude. Jim, no, that's not... Okay, this should go without saying, but especially if you're a dude and you're gonna one-on-one -on -one with a woman, keep in mind that it's easy for your intentions to be misinterpreted because all men are trash. The last thing you want to do in this kind of setting is tell your coworker you're in love with them. I mean, if you want to f*** your coworkers, that's fine, but for our purposes, do your best to keep romance out of the equation. It's possible that Jim is somebody who just can't keep his feelings from interfering with organizing, and in that case, the committee should decide on someone else to one-on-one -on -one with Pam. So in this step, we've examined how to figure out who to talk to, when, and where. But we haven't talked about what to say. What do you say during a one-on-one? -on -one? Step six. I Agitate means literally to get somebody angry about something, but that's not what this is about. During the agitate stage, you're listening more than talking. You try to follow the 80-20 rule. 80% listening, 20% talking, and you're helping reflect back, validate, and process grievances that your coworker expresses. You're also sort of trying to land them naturally into the justified emotion of anger, because anger is a motivating emotion that can be converted into action. Most coworkers feel bothered about something management is doing, but it's not your job to tell them what to be bothered about. Don't tell them what to think or how to feel and that if the veterans and the babies aren't safe and now the old people aren't safe none of us are safe here's an example of what an agitation conversation could look like during a planned one-on-one -on -one. yes yeah, so you got the email from monday right oh my fucking god yes i can't believe they're rolling back dental benefits next month that literally means all three of my kids have no dental insurance now oh whoa i didn't even know you had three kids that's ridiculous all three of your kids depended on these benefits too yes i'm just like how do they do they even care about us how much money are they actually saving by doing this i've been here seven fucking years but i have a foot out the door now i'm updating my resume i honestly couldn't focus at my desk earlier since hr sent the email i felt the exact same way honestly have you talked to others in the office i wonder how they feel the agitate stage can be a few minutes or a few months one coworker might talk your head off about 50 issues they're angry about another may take a long time to finally open up about how they think men get paid more than women on this job and it makes them just a tiny bit frustrated either way you're listening for these kinds of problems, tapping into completely justified anger, then shifting into the educate phase. Education within this context has a few components. First, it's about helping people understand their own power. Many believe they are powerless because their whole lives, nothing they did to stand up for what's right ever had an effect or they never tried because they were taught to just sit down and shut up or else. But you're helping them understand not only how to tap into their own inner sense of power, but how this power grows exponentially when people work together. For some, it helps to reference historical examples. People power is the only thing throughout history that ever really advanced progress and justice. From abolitionists to suffragists to civil rights and LGBT activists, in one conversation I had once, the coworker said something like, well, none of us have that Martin Luther King vibe, so nobody would listen to us. I pushed back and said, you know, MLK was just the spokesperson, and without a team behind him, we wouldn't even know about him. Others helped edit his speeches, his wife did his laundry while he practiced speeches in the mirror. My goal here wasn't to win an argument, it was to inspire them to understand that they have a powerful, important role in making the world a better place, starting right here at work. This particular coworker came around after like three months, but I had to pretty relentlessly encourage and prop them up. One of the many ways to start this education process is by putting the coworker into the role of problem solver, because it centers them as a powerful agent of change. What do you think we could do to stop them from cutting our dental benefits? If they answer off the bat they wish you guys had a union you're good to invite them to the next committee meeting but most coworkers won't jump to the u word so quickly some coworkers will share completely despairing comments like there's nothing we can do. They don't care about us. They don't even listen when we speak up. What's the point? All they care about is money. In this case, you really just want to help stick to the basic idea that if we all work together and stick together, we're going to do better than if we struggle in isolation. Some coworkers will have ideas about how to solve problems that aren't union-y per se, but can be expanded into more collective efforts so they can start to see how much more effective things are when they're done as a unified group. Example. What do you think we could do to stop them from cutting our dental benefits? Well, I was thinking of emailing Karen in HR and just letting her know honestly that this is going to really hurt my kids. But would that even make a difference? Well, it's not a bad idea, actually. It's probably better to say something than nothing. I mean, I'd email her too. That way she'd get two emails expressing concern. I don't know. I mean, what can Karen even do? It's above her, isn't it? Yeah, good point. Is Karen the best one for us to email? Maybe we should email Harold with corporate or Carlos, the new regional manager. We could email all of them. <laughs> hmm. 
Now that I think about it, this is a great idea. I mean, I bet we could get five or even ten others to email them. Maybe even sign a petition or something. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. But notice the agitator educator is still positioning the coworker as having the good ideas. The coworker's tone has already shifted from a low-level despair and talk about quitting to selecting targets in a potential email or petition campaign. All you did was tease these ideas out of them, then added in the bit about the petition to see what they'd say. If they're genuinely interested in organizing others to send a bunch of emails, it's probably safe to let them know about the committee. Hey, so actually, uh, me and a couple others have been meeting regularly, but in private, to talk more about this kind of stuff. You're free to find another job, I mean, do what's best for you and your kids, but we want to do our part to improve things around here while we're here. Do you want to come to our next meeting? If the coworker accepts the invite, you now move into a small dose of inoculation. First, what does inoculation mean? In the medical field, inoculation is when you give a dose of a virus to a bloodstream so your immune system can fight off the virus if it ever comes back in full force. This is how flu shots work. Inoculation also works well with misinformation, and this is important because if management finds out about your efforts, they'll begin to deploy misinformation to sabotage those efforts. Let me explain what a big dose of inoculation is. It's full-on studying the talking points that union-busting companies will use. I'll leave some elaborate examples in the description since this video is already taking way too long. But the most common kinds of talking points you'll hear are, we're all one big family, forming a union will just divide us. We already have a way to address grievances, just talk to your supervisor or HR. We always want to hear how we can do better. If you end up paying union dues, you'll be making less money, not more. Unions are associated with organized crime and communism. communism. You don't need to get into that with the coworker who just accepted the invite, but you do want to say something to them such as, Hey, so FYI, the reason the meeting is private, just between you, me, and John, is because we've already had experiences where management has given us the impression they don't want us talking amongst ourselves like this. It is our legal right, and we're not doing anything wrong, but we have to exercise a bit of caution anyway. At a later point, you can get into more details, but since you're likely to have three people on your organizing committee now, let's talk about what the organizing committee actually does. The organized phase is completely centered on what you do with the organizing committee. Each one-on-one -on -one you have, wherein you agitate, educate, and slightly inoculate your coworker is in service of building up this committee. The organizing committee meets regularly. That can mean monthly, every two weeks, every week. It depends on what you decide. These meetings should not happen on work time. Meet before work, on a lunch break, after work, or on a weekend. Choose a location where bosses won't randomly show up. Organizing committee meetings are structured. You don't just meet up and complain about the boss or spread rumors about coworkers. You build an agenda and eventually you adopt committee bylaws. Agendas cover things like updates to any lists and maps, grievance updates, updates on how the last one-on-one -on -one went, planning and role-playing new one-on-ones, inoculation sessions, planning actions. Here's a few actions you can take once your committee has become really solid and you have a few coworkers on board with the effort. Some of this stuff is high risk, such as going on strike. If you're all at-will employees, you could all be fired on the spot for this. But something like 5 to 10 people emailing HR and a regional manager respectfully requesting for a reversal in the decision to take away dental benefits is very low risk. Now that you're organized, you guys can look at your shared grievances, find one issue everyone collectively cares about, and assess how much risk you're willing to take to solve the problem. Some committees never decide to move on to the official unionized phase for a variety of reasons, but if you and your committee do want to go this direction, here's what you do. Let's say you and your committee are diverse as hell, you've been meeting for over a year, and on your list you've noted that 80% of coworkers support pushing for legal union status. They found that while being organized without union status has given them a deep sense of solidarity and the ability to pull off little wins here and there on certain issues, the added legal protections and bargaining potential a union offers has real teeth to it. The committee will want now to consult with a local union in a more official capacity than ever if they haven't been already. This is because the legal process is going to require employees to vote in favor of a specific union representing them for when it's time to negotiate and secure contracts. After you've chosen the union you want to represent you, the union will acquire signatures by every worker in support on something called union cards. Next, the union, in collaboration with the committee, 
will send a letter to your employer requesting voluntary recognition of the union based on a majority of workers wanting one. You guys will probably engage in a public campaign now too, meaning putting the message out on local TV stations, radio, newspapers, and social media. This puts your employer on the defense because if the public is on your side, it's the boss against not just all of you, but the community at large, potentially their consumer base. But most of the time, the employer now begins to wage a war. They don't recognize the union voluntarily, and now they opt for an election, wherein they, the employer, and you, the core workplace organizers, make your respective cases for and against the union as if this were a ballot initiative in a city, county, or state political election. Remember in step one, security, when I mentioned they start firing people, knowing full well it's illegal? Well, as soon as you go public like this, that's when they start. Your boss refers to their lists and maps, which they already had filed under HR this whole time, and they begin to reverse engineer everything you guys did. They try to figure out who's on the committee so they can fire some or all of them. They do whatever they can to gather information, including using any surveillance technology they have, like cameras, computer software, and like snitchy coworkers. They find weird and shady ways to make pro-union workers ineligible to vote and anti-union workers eligible who wouldn't otherwise have been eligible. It's basically like how politicians engage in voter suppression and redistricting, except it's your boss, and they do it even if they vote blue no matter who. I even know of a tiny ass nonprofit bike repair shop where the executive director, a pretty liberal and seemingly progressive dude, literally just fired the entire fucking staff instead of even bothering with an election. He made everyone sign non-disclosure agreements so they couldn't speak publicly about being wrongfully terminated. A small nonprofit bicycle repair shop led by a politically progressive boss. In many cases, management will hire a union busting company to do all this dirty shit for them because union busters are experts in this stuff. They know how to pit workers against each other, they know how to spread misinformation, and they'll often even make it seem like they're just consultants being hired to help solve workplace issues. Jeff Bezos hired union busters, Bill Gates, everybody's favorite philanthropist hired union busters. But if the committee has sufficiently inoculated everybody, the worst hit your majority will take is, on average, about 10%. Meaning, if you had 80% in support, it'll drop to about 70. If you had 61, it'll drop to 51. Anywho, once you're legally recognized as a union, it'll be much harder for the boss to fire any of you that have legal union status. This then means you can engage in any number of actions on any level of risk as a unified force in order to gain workplace improvements. But in most cases, having your union rep negotiate with your employer to get what you guys want prevents the need to even do things such as go on strike. Strikes tend to be a tactic that unions use after numerous less confrontational tactics. Well. That's how you unionize your workplace. Just going to use my shitty built-in microphone for the rest of this stuff. Jesse Ka, Frank Gazippi, Symbolic Megaphone, Vizzer, Callan, and Romantic Rachel helped edit the Google Doc that I made with the original script for this video, which changed many times. Thank you all very much. It changed so much you may not recognize part of it, but you were an invaluable help. Thank you very much. Uh, I made Dov say UAW while he was cooking one morning or evening or something. Um, he uh, He's part of a union that's organized by the UAW, so I thought that would be pretty appropriate. Also, you should definitely read his Jackman article. I'll throw a link in the description uh, about how uh, the Democrats have become worse and worse on immigration over the years. That It used to be like amnesty for all, and now it's like pathway to citizenship. Anyway, he's a genius with that stuff. Read the article. Fiona Ugly, uh, thank you once again for leaving me the voice messages, which I then put in the video. It's a great method so far. Fiona's videos are great. Follow the link in the description. Uh, just like hit the space bar or pause button if you want to read this, because I'm not going to read the whole thing. Man, uh, you patrons, I don't really know what to say. I'm making like 30 bucks a month from you guys now. I don't know what to say. That's fucking crazy. I'm going to do the like shout out to other leftist YouTubers thing now. So Jet Cloud, say, uh, young, hip, cool, black anarchist kid, uh, has a lot of interesting shit to say. I'm really eager to see what his next video is, whatever it's going to be on. Um, subscribe to him, check him out. Combabe, Clem is uh, just basically doing makeup tutorials, these like casual conversations while talking about stuff like uh, rent strikes and feminist socialism and uh, so she's out of London and I guess for me personally like talking about things like rent strikes like actual radical like tactics to achieve the goals we want is something I want to see more of and so she's uh, 
like not super well known yet. I hope she continues to put out more content and uh, to talk about radical stuff like that um, while doing like makeup tutorials. I, just, I think that's really exciting. Uh, Black Red Guard, uh, also Black Leftist YouTuber, but uh, philosophically probably much different than uh, Jet Cloud. Or actually, I'm not totally sure, but uh, Jet, you know, leans in a little bit more of the anarchist stuff. Um, Black Red Guard is uh, very strongly identified with Maoism or like Marxist Leninist Maoism or whatever. Uh, I'm not super well versed in that stuff. I try to read a theory here and there, but if you do want uh, some interesting uh, education on uh, communist uh, theory and everything, Black Red Guard is a great channel to follow, get that perspective. Man, I really love Halim Al Ra. Uh, shit, just his videos are like, they're really well put together. He explains like neoliberalism and it's probably probably about as much of the tanky as like Black Red Guard, but he just explains things a lot differently. Uh, I'm actually one of his patrons. Helen, you probably don't even know that because it's a different name, but anyway, don't tell anybody what my real name is if you know it. Uh, Mexi, she's a little bit bigger than probably the other ones I've mentioned so far, but like she's really good. The last two videos she's made on strategy stuff. I think some of the more important questions she's asking of like how do we get to the world we want um, and the most recent one, the like the s strategies continued one, I think talking about like tankies and anarchists and especially like aggressive leftist dudes uh, of which I could be categorized at times, uh, I think she's asking some really important questions about like how we orient ourselves toward each other. It was so funny when Thought Slime's video on how to finally defeat your boss came out because he was like, don't watch this on a workplace phone or computer and shit, and I was like, I'm literally like 70% done with the video that's all centered on that. So anyway, uh, his video is great. There's more, I, he has some really specific kind of like organizing tactics you can use. It's a pretty good video. It's very funny. Uh, one of the many reasons I like Angie Speaks is that she talks about paganism and spirituality and like union psychology. She identifies as an anarchist and we don't really see a lot of that coming out of leftist uh, writers, YouTubers, whatever. Um, but this interview I thought that came out last week as of the time of this recording uh, was really cool. I liked the title, Building an Emotionally Intelligent Left with Angie Speaks. Yeah, I would actually really like to see like a dialogue between her and Maxi on that stuff, like cancel culture, um, when we talk with meanness about and to each other online and offline, just sort of justice and all that. So yeah, the interview with the Michael Brooks show was great.